I think we are, we're kind of sit up, sitting on the precipice of so much change that's going to be driven by AI and that's going to be driven by crypto. Um, and I, I, like my primary feeling as a result of that is I just feel grateful. Like what a cool moment in yeah. history for all of us to be here. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with Jesse. Um, so uh, let's dive into it. Thank you so much for taking the time again. Um, just, you know, let's go over a little bit of your background. You've been uh, in Coinbase for a little bit of time. You've yeah. been the director of engineering and senior director of engineering for uh, for the retail part. So that means, you know, Coinbase and Coinbase Pro. And recently you're leading uh, the protocols team, right? Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about your background inside Coinbase? Yep. yep. So I, I joined Coinbase in 2017, very beginning of 2017. Uh, and the way I actually came into Coinbase uh, was through an aqua hire. Um, uh, that, that's what happens when you start a startup and it doesn't work. And then people say, hey, we don't want to buy your startup but we think you're talented and so you should come work with us. Um, and so I had started a company in 2013, uh, 20, you know, 2012, 2013, that was doing kind of identity and, and security, mostly for, for crypto companies. Um, you know, we worked with folks like Bitfinex and BitMEX uh, as customers back in 2013, 2014, um, did that for five years, that business didn't work. Um, and so we went through the acquire process uh, a, co a couple companies uh, kind of offered, hey, c come join our team. Um, my whole team actually went to Twilio, um, but I was so excited about crypto at the time uh, that I joined Coinbase. And so beginning of 2017, I joined Coinbase as an engineer. Uh, you know, it was still really small at that point. I think there was 25 engineers, uh, something like 70 employees total. Um, and then the next four and a half years, I basically um, kind of got to ride the rocket ship. So a few months in, I uh, transitioned from being an engineer to managing a team of engineers. You know, at the time it was like four or five engineers building Coinbase.com and the APIs that powered Coinbase.com. And then over the next four and a half years, um, it you know, went from four to five people, to 10 people, to 20 people, to 40 people, to 80 people, to 120 people, to 200 people. Um, and my kind of scope expanded from you know, the web and back end to include mobile Coinbase.com and then to include Coinbase Pro and then to include kind of all of Coinbase and Coinbase Wallet um, until I was kind of responsible on the engineering side for uh, kind of all of our consumer products. And then kind of middle end of 2021, I uh, basically said, hey, like this has been awesome. I've learned so much, but at this phase in my career, I, uh, I wanna go deeper into crypto. Like, I feel like, you know, uh, I'm now managing a lot of teams, a lot of people, which is really exciting, but I want to be at the kind of like ground level thinking about what is the kind of core protocol innovation that we need in order to enable the next wave of utility and the next wave of adoption that would bring us from, you know, small millions of people using crypto to billions of people all around the world using crypto. Um, and so uh, took a little time off to reflect on that and then came back and took up that mantle at the company. And so starting at the kind of end of 2021, I, uh, you know, first with a really small team basically said, okay, my job now is to figure out how do we bring Coinbase on chain? Um, and how do we move our business from being this kind of centralized custodial off chain product that was started in 2012 before smart contracts existed, before Ethereum existed um, and has, you know, grown into this incredible business but it's still very much of that off-chain world. And how do we transform building on kind of the, the, the starting points we have with Coinbase Wallet and CBE and USDC into a fully on-chain company that's powered by smart contracts, that's globally available, that's really leveraging uh, these new systems uh, that we're seeing upgrade the financial system all around the world um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's been the last journey over the last kind of year and a half, figuring out how do we do that for Coinbase? And out the other side, um, what we basically said is, hey, in order to do this for Coinbase, we need a developer platform. We need a native on-chain context where we can get started upgrading ourselves, and then we can support other people building new kinds of applications. And that's, that's exactly what Base is. Very interesting. So you talked a little bit about scaling the company, you know, from, you know, 420 and so on to, I think, 200 people. That's, yeah. that's pretty nuts. Uh, yeah, can you, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me and, you know, the people, um, at Only how, what, 
what lessons have you learned about scaling an organization and also Coinbase? Because from what I've heard, uh, my friend Maxine was at Coinbase l er early on. Love Maxine. Yeah, yeah, we worked very uh, close together for probably like two years, year and a half. Yeah, he, he's a close friend from school. Uh, so uh, he told me that, you know, there were, you guys experienced winters, right? As well as <laughs> summers. Um, so how was that experience and how was scaling, you know, the, the whole Coinbase platform and also the organization? What lessons have you learned there? Yeah, yeah. So I joined right at the beginning of 2017. I think Ethereum was worth maybe like $6 per Ethereum when I joined. Um, and it was before the 2017 bull market really started. Um, and so I got to see the full 2017 bull market all the way up to kind of the top in, in that November, December. And then I got to experience the 2018, 2019 uh, kind of bear market, which was a whole experience. And then the 2020 <laughs> up, uh, cycle again, and then the 2021, 2022, uh, and, and beginning of 2023 um, kind of bear builder market. Um, really, really interesting experience. In terms of learnings, hmm, I, I'd say a few things. So one is, um, and this is something that Brian uh, really likes to say, kind of uh, in both bear markets and bull markets, uh, is it's never as good as it seems, and it's never as bad as it seems. Uh, I think that's been this kind of like mantra that we repeat internally at Coinbase a lot, where it's like in the euphoria of the bull market, we need to bring ourselves down and say, hey, like this is not 100% real. Like, yes, there's all of this opportunity. And also a lot of this is euphoria that's kind of driven by speculation. And in the bear market, when we're at the total bottoms, the total pits, we then need to bring ourselves up and say, hey, like, yeah, it's <laughs> not the best time right now, but there's still so much opportunity to build. There's so much opportunity for us to kind of create together. And if we lean into that, um, we can make the most of this. Um, so I'd say that, that that was a big learning for me over the last six years is like, keeping an even kilter and trying to stay calm, cool, collected, and centered um, consistently as the markets and as the hype cycles go up and down. That's one. I'd say another one is um, uh, everything is in many ways about people and uh, scaling people is really hard. Uh, like, you know, going from uh, a team of three to a team of 200 um, we made so many mistakes along the way. And in the bull market, I think we grew too quickly and then we had to shrink. Um, we did that twice. Both times we said, hey, like, let's never do that again. And then, you know, the, the second time we were like, oh, maybe we should grow again really quickly. And then we, we kind of learned our lesson again. So I think, I think just kind of experiencing that and the, the takeaway for me is um, you can never be too deliberate and thoughtful about how quickly you grow the number of people on a team, um, like how methodical you are about who the right people are to join the team um, and how, how much leverage you can get from really small teams. And this is something that we've really leaned into with base, um, you know, and, and really the last two years of innovation that I've been driving is we've kept it really small. Um, and we've kind of had a, a focused core team that's been just hustling to try and figure out how do we make as much impact with as few people as possible. And I think the thing that's really made that possible is um, kind of the leverage and power you can get from building on chain, um, from writing smart contracts, from building in this new way. I really think that people are, can be 10 times more impactful. And, and that's what we've seen with base. And it's what we're seeing with builders who are building on base um, is that they can keep their teams really lean. Um, I think Farcaster is another great example of this where they, they built a whole Twitter product. And I think they have like four engineers right now. Uniswap built the whole exchange, the first version with one person. Um, and so I, I think that's been a big takeaway for me in the last six years of like both you can grow too fast and it's really, it can be really uh, hard and, 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 and kind of counterproductive. And in this new world, you don't have as much need to do that because these systems give you so much leverage to kind of build uh, with a small number of people. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I think Balaji was saying, I, I didn't confirm with Maxine, but USDC, I mean, the product built on Coinbase were just two people. And as you mentioned, Uniswap, uh, it's kind of crazy. You're, they're running, you know, this exchange, decentralized exchange. And uh, like, it's not only AWS, it's on Ethereum, right? And, and, yeah. and it's kind of nuts that, you know, you have so much volume, so much volume. It's like one of the fastest, if not the fastest exchange 
uh, growth stories in whole in the whole history of the you know. One hundred percent. And I was just looking at the chat. The Unlonely was built by one person. It's like literally yeah. one person built this, but because they were building on chain, they could just use Connect Your Wallet instead of having to build a whole massive complex identity system. Um, like there's all these efficiencies that you get when you build on chain. Um, and I think like this is kind of going to be the next generation of companies, the next generation of applications are going to lean into this and they're going to be able to have literally 10 times the impact um, that they would have had you know, with a much smaller number of people. Yeah, th that's great. And also people are ma mentioning ChatGPT. I personally got a lot of um, uh, efficiency gains by using it, you know, by using these chatbots. And like, I, I think crypto is another place where we can see a lot of leverage with these smart contracts because you don't necessarily need a backend, right? Like Ethereum yeah. might be the biggest competitor to AWS that they, I mean, I, I think they're, they're going to coexist. But like, you know, you're running this computing platform uh, that you don't necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily need to contract and people pay for it. Um, 100%. Yeah, that's... going on, on, on that point, of chat, I, I'm now using ChatGPT every day. Like Same. literally yeah. it, so much leverage, uh, so much opportunity to just, you know, have it solve things that previously I would spend hours solving. Um, I, I think we are... We're kind of sit up, sitting on the precipice of so much change that's going to be driven by AI, that's going to be driven by crypto. Um, and I, I, like my primary feeling as a result of that is I just feel grateful. Like <laughs> what a cool moment in yeah. history for all of us to be here, getting to build together uh, and kind of uh, create this new, create these new systems, upgrade the old systems with things that are 10x more efficient, uh, 10x more globally available, 10x cheaper. Um, that is. That, what more could we ask for in terms of what we get to do day to day? Yeah, I, I'm also very optimistic. And I, I think crypto will have, like, I, I mean, I wrote a book about AI, <laughs> uh, but I, like, I spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. But I think crypto is going to have a higher impact in society because, you know, like money is really, really important. And these computing platforms like, like Ethereum and whatnot will have a lot of impact. So let's move on uh, to to protocols and people were talking about this in the chat and they asked a little bit. They were also really glad that, you know, we're building on the bear market. Now, it, I mean, <laughs> we're getting back to, you know, Ethereum and whatever I call this price. the builder market. It's the builder you go market. To bear market, then you go to the builder market when the builders know what's going on, but the rest of the world doesn't quite know. And yeah. then we go full bull market. So builder spring. So let's talk about the builder market then. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how protocols fit into Coinbase overall? Like why, why is Coinbase going there and why, why is Coinbase investing in that area? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think uh, if you think about kind of the, the way the world works today, um, uh, most of the kind of financial systems that you and I use and, and the rest of the people use are, they're really old, right? Like you think about like doing a bank transfer, that bank transfer is probably running on paper or if not paper <laughs> running on like a cobalt software that was written in 1970. Like literally these things are 50 years old. And what that means is that they're slow, they're, they're fragile, they're expensive. Um, you know, sending money internationally for a uh, kind of remains. The average price is $45. We just did a whole analysis. It's $45. Oh, wow. Like someone, you immigrate to the United States, you want to send money back to your family in you know Turkey or Venezuela, or wherever, it costs you $45 to send that money. That's a huge chunk of whatever money you're sending. And that's because these systems are old. It's because they've been um, kind of filled with middlemen who are taking cuts. Uh, and they have all this fragility that means that they're you know, expensive and, and, and they break when people try and use them. And I think what Coinbase sees with protocols and what Coinbase sees with base and what Coinbase sees with uh, kind of crypto in general is this opportunity to upgrade those systems. Like literally we have a new platform that makes it easy for us to build new kinds of applications, which people also call protocols that are 10 to 100 times cheaper are globally available and accessible by default um, and can be built with teams that are 10 times smaller, like you and I were just talking about. And so the, the way Coinbase thinks about that for our business is what we want to be doing is we want to be doing two things. We want to be 
One, building infrastructure that makes it really, really easy for developers to create those protocols, to create those new kinds of applications that are upgrading the system. And then two, we want to build user experiences that can serve as almost a gateway to let everyday people access those protocols or access those applications. Um, and so on the builder side, that, that's what base is, right? It's an Ethereum layer two. The goal is to make it incredibly easy, safe, uh, developer friendly to build new kinds of applications on chain. And then on the user side, this is what Coinbase, this is what Coinbase wallet is. Uh, they are user experiences where people can just not have to worry that you can just use the apps and it, the complexity will be abstracted away from them. It'll be trusted. It'll be easy to use. Um, and they'll be able to get the benefits of this new upgraded system um, that's going to make their life easier. That's going to let them send money to their family uh, for 10 cents instead of $45. Um, that's going to make it so if they're a creator, they can earn more money than if they were publishing their song uh, you know, on Spotify by selling NFTs or, or creating kind of a deeper connection with their fans. Like all of our mission is about how can we upgrade the system by using these new platform to bring better experiences that increase economic freedom globally. Yeah, um, that's a great point. And that's something that I've heard people talking about. Oh, what about, you know, crypto? Like it hasn't like the criticisms, like, oh, it hasn't uh, reached product market fit. Like what, what is like, you know, what's the use case? And if you just look at stable coins, you were talking about remittances, like the usage has grown like crazy. And like, crazy. if you go, if you go to Argentina, for example, people are using it all the time. Or like, I've heard anecdotes of like people in Russia, uh, a friend that, you know, is Russian, uh, I mean, Obviously, there are problems there, and they sold, you know, their apartment through USDC or US uh, or some other stablecoin. And these stablecoins allow people to send money overseas without a centralized, uh, like Venmo 100%. or whatever, right? Yeah, and this, you know, I was in I was in DC yesterday at the Senate building talking with staffers, um, kind of like people who work for senators um, and, and House House representatives too. And I think this is what we are trying to. Um, help policymakers understand because I think uh, like in all of the noise around crypto, uh, the signal is getting a little bit lost and they see some of the bad actors and they kind of project that onto all the crypto. But what we're trying to help show is like, look, we're not just saying like this is going to happen one day or like this could be really cool. Like people are using crypto every day to make their lives better, to make yeah. it so that they can get money to their family in places that they couldn't previously, or to make it so they can keep more value in their local community, or to make it so that they have an identity that's private to them, that's sovereign, that's not controlled by one corporation that's gonna lose it when <laughs> it gets hacked. Like, th these are not speculative use cases. These are things that millions of people all around the world are doing every day with crypto that crypto is enabling because it's upgraded these legacy systems to make them easier, safer, and more accessible. Like that's real. And whenever people say, what do you use crypto for? It's like, well, now I just have a list. I just run through the list. Like, let me literally <laughs> tell you about the five to 10 different use cases that deliver 10 X better results for the people who are using crypto to do them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. That's great. So you talk a little bit more about, you know, Coinbase offering, uh, products on chain and and base mm -hmm. being the L2 that that you know uh, will help Coinbase uh, build there. Uh, why why should Coinbase you know be the one building it and like what what kind of value does it bring? You you talked mm -hmm. about Coinbase wallet and things like that. Um, how how does Coinbase fit in that picture? Can you talk a little bit more into detail like yeah. what's going on there? Yeah, absolutely, and and like. It was a long journey for us deciding to build base. Um, mm -hmm. When we when I started working on bringing Coinbase on chain in late 2021, it, the first idea was not let's build the layer two. Um, we actually went through three different other ideas: um, one around identity, uh, one around advertising, and one around kind of like a marketplace. And I think at each point, as we were building those products, we ran into the same problems, which is um, like how do we build 
on-chain products really easily. And then when we build them, where do we put them so that they can actually work for everyday people? So it's not like this incredibly complex process of jumping through hoops in order to use the product that we build. And I think after trying to build three products and getting stuck on the same problem again and again, um, that was when we started being like, okay, we, we need to create more clarity for Coinbase on this question of like, how and where do we build? And so in the first half of 2022, we kind of aligned the whole business to, we're gonna build on Ethereum, we're gonna write EVM, um, and we think L2 is gonna be the place where these applications scale, you know, and they can reach billions of people. Um, and in the second half of uh, 2022, we then did a bunch of more research, a bunch more exploration and said, oh, like L2 isn't just gonna be one thing. There's gonna be many layer twos. There's gonna be many chains that kind of work together to scale Ethereum. And in that world, if Coinbase can put our resources into helping with that, and put our resources into kind of creating uh, a context where we can make it easier for our internal developers and external developers to build. And then I think most importantly, connect that into our user experiences in Coinbase and Coinbase Wallet. That's gonna be a huge contribution to the industry. And there's a bunch of complexity around that. And we wanna make sure we do it in the right way. And that's why you know we've committed to base being open source and decentralized, built on the open, open source OP stack, um, uh, that, that's why we, you know, stay based for everyone we, and we're working to make it totally global, you know, having a fortune 500 centralized, uh, business, uh, launch a decentralized layer two, that that's a complex thing, but we, we think that there's a, a very clear path that we're doing that's going to, uh, bring, you know, the next billion people into the crypto economy and they'll come from off chain. They'll come through Coinbase and Coinbase wallet onto base, but then we're going to support them to go everywhere. Um, and this is another big value for us, this idea of kind of base as a bridge, not an island, um, where we don't want people to get stuck on base. We want base to be a stepping stone for them to explore the broader crypto economy. And so when I think about kind of what Coinbase is bringing here with base and why we're doing this, th that's it. It's like, we know we have the kind of largest, most trusted brand in crypto. We know that users trust us to help them enter this kind of on-chain crypto economy. And we wanna help them come into this incredible new world of applications that are being built um, and use them uh, in a way that feels safe, uh, secure, and low cost, um, and brings them kind of a, a better day-to-day better, better day experience for their life. So that, that's what we're focused on. It's like get the existing 110 million users and $90 billion worth of assets that are on Coinbase products today on-chain, and then help the you know, five, six, seven, eight billion people in the world who uh, are, are having internet connections and can start to access these products come on chain as quickly as possible. That's great. So from, it, it seems pretty clear that, you know, Coinbase has been trying to build on-chain products and base is basically, you know, what Coinbase and others need. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, why did you decide to go build a L2 and, and basically on top of optimism, yeah. optimism, I, sorry, my pronunciation is not great. Instead of, you oh, know, good. for example, Z, ZK rollups and, you know, instead of building on the optimism stack versus, yeah. for example, the uh, Arbitrum stack and like, what are the trade-offs here and how yeah. do you great. see L2s and L1s in the future? Yeah. Um, and I'll start with maybe like why L2? Um, and I think it's maybe as useful context, uh, this was not the first time Coinbase had looked at building a chain. We actually had a whole kind of company process in 2018 uh, and 2020 where we said, hey, maybe we should build a chain. We did a bunch of diligence. We looked at it. And I think in both of those kind of time periods, the only kind of option, like the option that came up at the end was like, let's go build another L1. Um, like Ethereum had fully established itself. Um, there were a lot of scaling and performance concerns. And I think when we got to that kind of path, our feeling was if we go build an L1, like we're going to be, uh, like creating a silo, like we're going to be like creating a context that pulls people out of the crypto economy as it's already developing today. And that's going to, you know, have a risk of doing more harm than good. Um, and so both of those times we said, Hey, let's not do this. Like now's not the right time. And I think in 2022, as we looked at this for the third time, after having run into <laughs> these problems of like, where do we do this? Where do we build? Um, 
And Ethereum had, I think, established itself much more. EVM had become kind of like far and away the most adopted developer platform. It felt like for the first time there was really a path here where we could um, both kind of invest in building a kind of chain that would serve as a platform for us and for, for developers to build with us, um, but we could do it in a way that was still deeply, deeply interconnected. Um, and that's when L2 is, right? By building it as an L2, we're deeply interconnected to Ethereum. Users can go back and forth from Ethereum incredibly easily. We inherit the Ethereum security model. We use Ethereum as the kind of native token. Um, we like connect ourselves into Ethereum rather than isolating ourselves from the crypto economy. Um, and we can have kind of the uh, agency, the, the opportunity for us to kind of still invest in the platform, still create a context where um, we can build and feel kind of the surety that, that comes with having our own, own place in the Ethereum uh, crypto economy. And so that, that's what drove us to be an L2. It was this feeling of like, we both want to have a home, but we also want to make sure that home isn't off to the side. Instead, it is deeply, deeply connected into everyone else. In terms of why optimism, um, I, I think it flows from a lot of the same principles. Um, you know, when we thought about, okay, now we think that there's an opportunity to build an L2, like how do we want to build this L2? Um, making sure that it was decentralized, making sure that it was open source were really important. Um, I think these were places where um, the OP stack is fully open source. It's MIT licensed. It's freely available. Anyone can fork it. Anyone can do anything that they want with it. That felt really aligned to the way Ethereum has been built and the way we wanted to build. Um, optimism, I think if you look at their track record around decentralization and, and governance, they too have been incredible leaders. And I think that was really important to us. Um, like Coinbase is, again, a centralized Fortune 500 company. And so working with someone who is almost on the other end of the spectrum, who has been leading the way on decentralized governance, who has been um, kind of pioneering there, felt like a really uh, powerful complement um, uh, in terms of kind of building together. And then from a technology perspective, I think we saw that the, the technology was, was just, it was good. And it was built in a way that was modular, um, which basically means that um, the, the kind of OP stack is built such that uh, components of it can be upgraded over time. And so an example of this is uh, kind of the proving stack. Uh, you know, people talk about ZK rollups or optimistic rollups. Um, we don't really think about it that way and the OP stack doesn't really think about it that way. Instead, we think about it with a, as rollup, which then has an optimistic prover or a ZK prover. And those can be swapped out. They can be replaced. They can be run in parallel. There can be multiple provers. And so I think our thesis is let's start with the rollup. Let's start with an optimistic prover because that's the thing that kind of uh, is, is ready faster and, and kind of uh, more trusted today. But then as soon as those kind of ZK systems uh, are ready uh, and they're, they're open source, like let's integrate them in and let's make sure that we get the best of kind of both worlds. And with the OP stack, there's a really clear path to doing that. And so th those were the drivers, the, the kind of like the open source, the decentralization, the, the technology. I guess the one other one was um, the, the team. You know, we, we actually started working with the Optimism team at the beginning of 2022 before BASE existed on something called EIP4844, uh, which is an upgrade to Ethereum that's going to lower the cost of layer twos by uh, 10 to 100x. Um, uh, kind of Coinbase and Optimism uh, started working on that uh, with a bunch of Ethereum core developers um, in the beginning of last year. And we spent you know, nine months working on that, just working on making Ethereum cheaper for all L2s, even before Base existed. And that was kind of this context where we got to know each other. We saw that we shared similar values um, and we kind of laid a foundation on top of which we could then kind of build the base, uh, you know, building on that trusted relationship that we already had. That's awesome. So uh, let's go over, you know, uh, this uh, EIP 484844 proto dunk sharding. Yeah. Uh, can you describe a little bit what it is and like why is it important? You mentioned, you know, you're helping scale L2s, uh, but like, can you describe technically or maybe yeah. not too technically, but a little bit? Uh, what it is and what's the timeline there and yeah. what is Coinbase and, and, you know, other teams helping there? What are you guys doing Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, uh, EIP 4844, it's an upgrade to Ethereum. Um, so you know how we just had that kind of withdrawal upgrade that happened two days ago. Um, it's like that, but different. 
Um, uh, and it's kind of committed to be the centerpiece of the next big Ethereum release. Um, and so we don't have an exact timeline on that, uh, but I think sometime later this year is, is, is realistic. Um, and what EIP 4844 does is the way rollups work today is they basically take, you know, rollups, L2s, uh, you know, optimism, Arbitrum, they take a bunch of transactions um, that are done at the layer two and they package them up, they compress them, and then they publish them to layer one. They put them on Ethereum. Like they just say, hey, here's the L2 transactions and them publishing them to Ethereum, the layer two publishing to layer one, that's the thing that allows the layer two to inherit the security and decentralization of Ethereum. But today, the way those layer twos work and the way they publish it is they just publish that data, the transaction data, alongside all of the other data that's going on in Ethereum. So it's like, you know, in a Ethereum block, there's like one transaction that's like a thousand L2 transactions all bundled together. And then right next to it, there's like 25 Uniswap transactions. And then there's like the MEV searchers transaction that's optimizing this. And so what that means is it means two things. One is it means that um, those uh, layer twos, when they publish those transactions, they're paying the same price to publish that data as if they were any other Ethereum transaction, not like some special price that's tuned and optimized for the specific needs that the layer two has. And then two, it means that when they're publishing that data, they're publishing it in the same market for fees as all the other transactions. And so let's say there's a really big price spike on Ethereum uh, and there's a ton of other demand for transactions on Ethereum because people are trading and arbitraging and doing whatever. <laughs> That's going to drive up the price of the layer two rollup publication because they're going to have to compete with the Uniswap transaction and the MEV searcher transaction. All of them are basically competing in the same market. And so what if what EIP 4844 does is it basically says, hey, we know that these kind of roll-up transactions are a very specific type of transaction. Uh, and we can create a new kind of what's called data availability for them, like mm -hmm. a new way of storing them in Ethereum, which we call blob space, B-L-O-B-S-P-A-C-E, blob space. Um, and we can do two things with that. One is we can more finely tune the pricing for that storage because rollups have different characteristics. So for example, we don't actually need to store all of the rollup data in the blockchain for per in perpetuity. So we only store it for two weeks. And then oh, we wow. store like a little commitment of the data in perpetuity, which allows us to reference it as necessary. So that means that from a kind of uh, state and state growth perspective and an impact to network perspective, it's much lower because now we're only storing this data for two weeks, which means it's like a fixed impact um, on kind of the storage that node operators need. And then two, uh, because this is like a new kind of data storage, we can basically have a separate market for it that doesn't compete with the Uniswap transactions. And so what this means is it means that uh, when we have blob space post EIP 4844, the, the transactions that rollups publish to layer one to kind of submit their uh, transactions and get that security and decentralization, they're going to be lower cost because they're gonna be priced appropriately for the kind of resource needs that the rollup has. And then they are going to be more consistent and not driven by kind of uh, the demand for L1 other block space, but instead just driven by the demand for roll up blob space. And so that just means that fees are gonna go down and we're gonna see less of those intense spikes at layer two uh, in terms of fees, because it's not gonna be influenced by the L1 kind of primary uh, fee market. Interesting. And can you verify? So you mentioned that, you know, uh, I think the blobs uh, space lasts for two weeks. Can you verify that, that a transaction or something happened in the future? Yeah, like, let's exactly. say two years from now? Yeah. So basically what happens is the, the transaction gets put into that blob space. And then alongside it going into the blob space, what's called a commitment, which is like basically a cryptographic proof that that data was there gets put into the regular block space. And so in two weeks, the transaction full data is basically like pruned out. It's, it's thrown away, but those commitments 
are in the block space, the Ethereum block space in perpetuity. And so what that means is it means that if someone needs to verify, hey, was this transaction here? Or hey, like let's do this uh, kind of like fraud game for an optimistic rollup, they can uh, reference the commitment and then they can provide the data. And on chain in smart contracts, you can be, oh, does this data match this commitment? Therefore, we can see that that transaction was there. I mean, it's a really cool design, really, really smart. Um, and that's all the, the, in order to have that commitment, um, we have, we, we've had to do kind of this complex cryptography. Uh, so if you, if you saw like the KZG ceremony at ceremony.ethereum.org, that's basically this whole kind of like setup that, uh, is bringing all this random input from people all over the world, which will make it possible for us to have those commitments in a trusted, safe way. Um, uh, in perpetuity in Ethereum, but requires kind of a bunch of people coming together to create the randomness that makes sure it's secure. That 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, you are all starting to work on, uh, on base, and you know, this is definitely an ongoing effort, and it's just the start. And yep. you know, uh, can you base is L two, and you know, there it seems that there are different stages for L twos. And Vitalik described a little bit, you know, the different stages and things like that. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the different stages of L2s yeah. and, and how does space fit in that picture, which stage it is and what's the, yep. the plan in general for base? Great question. Yeah. So Vitalik has this great kind of definition that he's, he's created, which I think is, is continuing to be refined. The L2 beat folks who I think are really like leading the industry on um, kind of defining these things. Uh, they are continuing to iterate as well, but he kind of broke out rollups into three stages, stage zero, stage one, and stage two. Um, and stage two rollup is like, this rollup has the same kind of decentralization and, and security characteristics as Ethereum. Like we could basically think about it as a pure extension of Ethereum. Um, and you achieve that by having kind of uh, really, really decentralized uh, kind of upgradability for the smart contracts, um, having uh, verifier provers on the network that are live and, and really hardened, uh, potentially multiple of them, um, and, and, and minimizing the number of kind of training wheels uh, or kind of safeguards that could be uh, kind of uh, leveraged if something went wrong in that rollup. And rollups are going to get to stage two basically as they mature. So the more the more they mature, the more kind of the technology evolves, the, the, the further they're going to progress towards stage two. Stage one is like, there's some training wheels, but they're they're minimal. And then stage zero is like there's a lot of training wheels. <laughs> and where base is going to start, you know, like uh, kind of a lot of the rollups in the market today, is it's going to start at stage zero. Um, this year, uh, we have a line of sight to progressing it to stage one. And then next year, uh, we think there's a path to getting it to stage two. And so that means that, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, we're not going to be 100% uh, all the way at the stage two. Um, but this is kind of the process of building these complex systems. Um, and I think this is kind of the, the balance that we are uh, walking as, a, as an industry of like, how do we make sure that we both um, kind of uh, decentralize systems while also uh, doing that in a really methodical, deliberate way? that, uh, you know, has safeguards in case things go wrong in the early stages so that we can um, protect users and, and make sure that things are working in the way we expect. So um, a lot of work to do there. Uh, decentralization and getting from stage zero to stage one is the kind of P0 priority for our team, um, for the optimism team. And I think one of the things I'm really excited about in the way we're building base is uh, rather than saying, hey, we're gonna go start at stage zero and we're gonna go start off by ourselves, and have to do all this work ourselves and not gonna, gonna contribute back to the broader ecosystem. Instead, we're saying, no, we're gonna contribute all of our resources to an open source MIT license, freely available code base, which means that as we contribute to it, we're gonna accelerate the work that's already happening there. We're gonna take the Coinbase and base engineers and put them alongside the Optimism engineers. And when those results come through by the, the stack becoming more decentralized, more secure, those results, you know, th those benefits aren't just gonna accrue to Coinbase and base, they're also gonna, you know, uh, go to Optimism mainnet. Uh, and they're gonna go to all of the rollups that are built on Caldera. You know, there's, uh, you know, every day I feel like I see a new rollup that is launching on the OP stack. Uh, 
Uh, like literally every day, it feels like I see a tweet about it. And we are basically investing our resources and making it so that all of those rollups are decentralized um, and secure, uh, rather than Coinbase kind of or base just kind of siloing that and taking that for ourselves. Interesting. So, I mean, you talked a little bit about decentralization, and I think that's you know something that uh, people are talking about in the long way chat, like. Um, there was like the OFAC case with, you know, Tornado and Cash, which I think uh, Coinbase is, is actually, uh, uh, you know, taking action to help help out developers and help help out uh, yeah. Torna uh, Tornado. Um, but how, how do you prevent in the future that, you know, that situation? How can you move towards decentralization? And, you know, like what's what's the goal? So, you, I mean, you talk... Uh, the, uh, the fact that, you know, base is, is in the stage zero. And I imagine like a bunch of L2s are in the same stage. Like how do we move yeah. towards there? And, you know, like what's, what's the roadmap there and what's the thinking to, uh, there? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, and, and before I get into the base side, I, I think it's just worth kind of like doubling down on what you said around Coinbase's work. Um, we, you know, we, we just submitted an amicus brief, uh, or I don't know whether it was an amicus brief or it was actually the first component of the, the suit, but um, uh, working with a bunch of plaintiffs, plaintiffs, we're basically bringing to court um, that we think that the OFAC ruling around um, Tornado Cash or the OFAC decision or, uh, to add Tornado Cash to the sanctions list is unconstitutional. Um, and there's like, you know, you can go look at our chief legal officer, Paul Gruwal, you know, I think he has like five or six different reasons it's unconstitutional, <laughs> uh, including the fact that, um, you know, you, you can't sanction a piece of software uh, that that's like saying, hey, we're going to sanction a book. Uh, and like anyone who interacts or reads with that book is, uh, you know, going to be violating the law here. And so um, I think our kind of North Star here is we believe that privacy um, uh, and we believe that the right to run um, kind of open source software, those are constitutional rights. And Coinbase will um, stand up for and defend those constitutional rights um, uh, in an environment where there's regulatory uncertainty. And I, I think, like, importantly, you don't just see us doing that with Tornado Cash. I think if you look at our track record kind of across the board on these things, if you look at how we've talked about Ethereum and staking and validators, um, uh, we, we've been really consistent. Uh, we've said we believe that running uh, open source software is a constitutional right, and we're going to continue standing up for that, um, continue defending that right. And so that that's kind of where Coinbase is coming from. Uh, like we believe in decentralization, we believe in open source, we're going to continue advocating for that. How that applies to Base, um, uh, kind of we talked about Base is going to start as a stage zero rollup. It's going to progress to stage one really quickly, and, and then stage two. Uh, our intention is for Base to remain fully open and permissionless. Um, that's uh, a complex challenge, uh, but one that we feel like we are well suited to, um, and one that we feel like we have built a track record uh, standing up for over the last few years, and we will continue building the track record in the years ahead, um, uh, standing up for as well. And so, uh, like, we're going to let our actions speak for themselves uh, as we bring base to mainnet, um, and as we continue to champion the open, uh, accessible, global on-chain economy that we've been working to build over the last like, 12, 13 years. That's awesome. So I guess uh, what you basically mentioned is that like, that's the goal of BASE, to be more decentralized as other L2s, right? And, yeah. and, and the EIP4844 is just part of it, right? Like you're helping other, other L2s. And, that's the goal of Ethereum as well, right? Like to become more and more decentralized. Um, yeah, that's and, and I think importantly, like EIP four eight four four, we've been we we started working on that before Base existed because oh. we felt L, all L twos needed to get cheaper, and we're continuing to work on it while Base exists, still because we think all L twos need to get cheaper. And I think this is our like thesis: is it's not just going to be Base. Like we don't want it to be Ethereum and then Base, and that's it. We believe that there's going to be a bunch of these layer twos, a bunch of these rollups, layer threes, uh, just thousands of chains that are all going to work together collectively to scale Ethereum. Kind of like there are thousands of ISPs um, and thousands of internet providers who all work together to scale the internet. Um, I think we're at this early stage in the infrastructure where that is 
um, uh, still really visible to most people, but I think we're pretty quickly moving towards a world where um, a lot of this is going to be kind of abstracted away from the everyday person, but behind the scenes, you're going to have tons and tons of systems that are working together to, to kind of scale the on-chain economy. Uh, sounds good. Um, so, I mean, uh, another part of it that, I mean, uh, that's a question that comes from me, like, why, why not, you know, Solana, like, you know, uh, and one part of Solana that I, I, I think I understand is the fact that, you know, they use this, uh, verifiable delay functions to basically sync the <laughs> clocks of, you know, um, yeah. uh, why are there, uh, Ethereum L2s that are using, uh, this system? Why, why is that not being, uh, brought up into Ethereum and why, why build on top of Ethereum instead of uh, you know, Solana or whatever, or other yeah. um, L1s. Um, uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about EVM, but can you uh, yeah, talk about yeah, this as well? Yeah, can absolutely go into that. And, and uh, I will say, I, 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 I'm a Solana user. I've, uh, uh, I'm like going to get the Solana phone just to try it out, experiment with it. I need a new Android phone anyway. Um, <laughs> like the growth that's happening. I mean, there's a ton of really exciting uh, crypto use cases growing on Solana right now. Uh, if you look at things like Hub Mapper, um, that's kind of mapping uh, like huge amounts of the the kind of roadway in the United States and globally. Um, Helium. Uh, so a big fan of Solana uh, and uh, excited to work with them to scale the crypto economy. You know, it's not just going to be Ethereum. It's not just going to be Base. Uh, it's going to be all of these things working together to kind of bring about the, the this upgrade of the system that we're trying to do. In terms of kind of like what brought us to Ethereum, I, I think like it's, it's really the ecosystem um, and the, the infrastructure around the EVM. Um, when we worked with like internal developers at Coinbase uh, and external developers, I think what we saw is that the vast, vast, vast majority of people were building on EVM and the vast, vast, vast majority of infrastructure, wallets, node providers, um, the, they were supporting EVM. Um, and I actually think this is one of the really remarkable things about base. Um, you know, we started working on base, uh, maybe, uh, like end of, end of last summer. Um, and you know, when we launched base, the test net, we had something like a hundred different dApps or 120 different dApps and infrastructure oh, wow. providers that were mm -hmm. committed, uh, supporting the test net, supporting the main net. I think today we have like more than 200, like approaching 300. Um, and one of the like reasons we were able to do that is because the incremental cost for them to support base because it's an EVM chain is really low. Like Uniswap coming to base, that's just them deploying their contracts again. Versus if we were saying, hey, you know, we're building a new L1 with its own VM, um, or even like we're, we're using the Solana VM, like we would get access to the Solana ecosystem of apps, but the ecosystem of EVM apps today, from a TVL perspective, from a user perspective, from an app perspective, is just, it, it's 10 times bigger. And so I think that was really the thing that brought us to Ethereum, helped us decide to build an Ethereum L2, was the, the growth of the ecosystem um, that uh, you know, made it possible for us to hit the ground running uh, without having to restart everything from scratch. I think one of the, one of the like, analogies that I, I think a lot about here is, um, kind of JavaScript uh, <laughs> and kind of the rise and, and, and uh, stickiness of JavaScript as the platform of the internet. Like there are a million things that are bad about JavaScript. And, you know, there were literally probably decades uh, where people were like, JavaScript's never going to stay on browsers. Um, it's going to get replaced. People are going to use other languages. And then it's just stuck because there was this flywheel that started, this ecosystem that built, and it got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And what people figured out how to do is they figured out, okay, like how do we incrementally upgrade and incrementally improve this JavaScript technology? And that's what's led to today, you know, TypeScript. And uh, like all of this infrastructure that we built around JavaScript that has then worked its way back into the language and made it better and better and better over time. And I think this is what we're already starting to see with the EVM is that it, it started with that stickiness. It was like the first thing which let it build kind of like a really, really powerful network effect. And then because of that stickiness, it's creating this kind of virality, viral feedback loop where the best innovations that are happening outside the EVM are getting brought into the EVM and getting brought into the Ethereum ecosystem. And so like a concrete example of this is I was on Twitter yesterday and um, was, you know, someone was like, 
it would be really cool if rollups adopted IBC and which is like an, a Cosmos interoperability protocol. Yep. And I was like, great, let's do it. Let's add to the OP <laughs> stack. And that's totally possible. Like there's nothing proprietary about uh, IBC. There's nothing to say that it couldn't integrate with EVM or the OP stack. It's all possible. And I think that the EVM and Ethereum and, and layer twos and increasingly the OP stack, they're just becoming this shelling point where everything's going to plug into it. And so there may be other ecosystems, but they're all going to kind of connect into Ethereum, which is going to give it the most access. And, and that's, that's where we wanted to build base because it felt like the, the logical place for Coinbase to have a hub, which could then, of course, connect to everything else because base is not an island, it's a bridge. Um, and so, you know, we're going to connect to Solana, we're going to connect to Bitcoin, we're going to connect to Avalanche, we're going to connect to uh, Polygon, we're going to connect to all of these other ecosystems that aren't Ethereum L2s. Um, but like Ethereum felt like the right place to start. Yeah, I agree 100%. And tweeted back then, I'm like, Ethereum is the new JavaScript because like <laughs> everything is being built. I mean, if you look at it like JavaScript, you can like, I, I build everything in JavaScript right now from the server, you know, to through right. the application and like, I mean, JavaScript has such a developer ecosystem and it seems like Ethereum is like the same way, but in the crypto land. Uh, so let's go over, you know, uh, why, why should developers choose base, right? Like why, like if, if I'm building a new app, why should I build, you know, on top of base? You, you mentioned that's like really, really easy. So if yeah. you have it on, uh, on the Ethereum, uh, L1, it's, you basically have the same contract, but just deploy to base, but what are the other benefits? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, uh, there's an, another kind of leader at Coinbase who, um, I've spent a lot of time kind of workshopping and thinking about what, how we would focus base. And he, he, um, I forget exactly the framing, but he was like, don't overthink this. Just like figure out the really simple, almost kind of dumb answer that is why base wins and why base differentiates and and focus on that and so like for me that's like it's easy to use it's secure it's developer friendly and it connects you to the world of coinbase distribution which starts with 110 million users and 80 billion dollars worth of assets and it's going to grow to billions of users over the next few years like that's it <laughs> Easy, secure, developer-friendly, connected to massive distribution. Um, and I think that, that that's not the like, you know, most complex, like we're the best technology. Like, no, actually like we're building on technology and making it available to everyone because we think that's good for the industry. Um, but we're focused on making this easy, secure, developer-friendly and connecting people who build on base to millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of users. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. That's what matters for crypto businesses. It's can they easily, securely build really powerful applications that billions of people want to use? And we're going to be connecting those dots to make it happen. That's awesome. Um, so let's jump in uh, towards, you know, on chain and things like that. We talked a, a lot about base. Uh, I think you said uh, this on a Twitter space and uh, Brian tweeted it out or I, I, I saw it somewhere. Uh, Basically, on-chain is the new online. Uh, yep. Uh, I, I like that phrase, on-chain is the new online. What do you mean by that? Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll give credit to um, Jacob Horn. I actually, he, the founder of Zora, I think I heard it from him first, but I have definitely been on a campaign over the last few months. We had it in the base video. It just feels really resonant to us. And what I mean by that is, um, if you look at the way online changed the world, like the internet changed the world, before the internet, um, like developers could still build products, but they couldn't reach anyone. You know, it was like you'd build this app or, or like a little piece of software and then it would go to like a mainframe or get deployed on, you know, floppy disks. Uh, and then the internet came around and it totally changed the world. I mean, as a result of online, we are here now doing this live video call that's getting streamed through Unlonely with like however many hundred people in the chat, like, you know, I don't even know, peanut gallerying us. Um, you know, we, we, we had the last 20 years of innovation. Um, and I think that was incredibly powerful. And also there, there were um, like significant things that online left to be desired. Um, in particular, uh, even in a world where internet 
allowed information to flow free, freely, value and money was still very, very controlled, very, very gate kept. It's like, if you wanted to do anything with value, you had to like work with the banks or and you had to like be in your country and your country only, and you couldn't build anything that anyone else in the world could use. And if you wanted to build online, like you had to give your data to these businesses. Like you would only work in a centralized way where all the data got pooled and extracted and leaked. And uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's not a good thing. And I think our thesis is that we are kind of on the precipice of a similar transformation of the world that happened with the internet. But instead of the internet, it's crypto. And instead of online, it's on-chain. Um, and that in this new on-chain world, we have all of the benefits of the internet, that free flowing uh, flow of information. And for the first time, we have free flows of value and money. We have the ability for people to build applications with value and money that anyone anywhere in the world can access. Um, and we have uh, like a, a level of sovereignty in the way these systems can be built that allows people to keep control of their data, keep control of their information, keep control of their lives, their money, every part of it, um, and not give that up to centralized actors. And we think that that's, we think that's gonna change the world. Like there's, there's no other way of saying it. We think that like in the late 90s, early 2000s, all the way through now, every single part of our world is gonna come on chain. It's gonna be transformed. It's gonna be transformed for the better. It's going to lead to more economic freedom globally. Uh, it's going to lead to better product experiences. It's going to lead to happier people. And I think like the the call of on chain is the next online is like the the time is now. Like we are building the future, and the more that all of us can believe that this future is possible and that we can work together to make it come faster, the the sooner we're going to be able to bring all the benefits of on chain to everyone else get to billions of people using these systems every day and get all the outcomes that we care about. So it's, it, it really, you know, we've, we've been releasing ads on this. It's like, we are upgrading the system again. We did it once with the internet. <laughs> now let's do it again with crypto. And this time let's go get the worst experiences that all of us deal with every day, which are the banks, which are these movements of money, which is our broken identity systems. And let's upgrade them to be better for everyone to use. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So in the same way that, you know, uh, online had the tier ones and tier two ISPs and people don't think about it, like, is there a similar analogy for, for, for on-chain and how do you think about it? Yeah, it's Ethereum layer one and layer two and layer three, like all of these kind of chains that, you know, us people of the crypto on-chain economy are so familiar with today um, and all of us make decisions on every day, I, I, th I think they're going to increasingly fade into the background. Um, and people are going to go back to what they expect, which is that they just want to use applications that, that bring them value in their life. And like no one knows what ISP they use as the tier two or tier three ISP, I think people are going to increasingly not know what chain they're using when they're running an application. Now, there's going to be characteristics that they care about, which I think mostly are going to impact what kind of applications are available because developers are going to choose um, things like decentralization, things like security. But for the everyday user, I think they're just going to run the app and it's just going to work. And so I think we still have a little bit more infrastructure to um, build in order to make that possible. But that's, that's definitely the world we're heading to. It's a world where um, users just use products that they love and the infrastructure complexity is, is abstracted away from them. Awesome. Uh, just two more questions. We're right uh, uh, around our time. Um, so, I mean, you talked about decentralization, how developers will choose um, different, you know, chains uh, because of cent centralization. Why, like, the, how much does the decentralization matter to users? Like, mm -hmm. for example, Argentina, uh, they they used to use or they use Binance Smart Chain uh, and, yeah. you know, got, they gather a lot of popularity and it's not as much decentralized. So the question is like, how much does it matter? Or, I mean, maybe the question is, when does it matter? Because it might yeah. not matter right now, but at some point it might matter a ton, a ton right? Yeah. So, um, I, th I, think it, I think it matters a lot. I think it's worth fighting for. I also think it's worth recognizing that even if Binance Smart Chain is maybe more centralized than Ethereum, it's still much more decentralized than pretty much any financial system we've ever had before. Um, in that, like, 
uh, you can have a bunch of different exchanges that integrate with it. And you can have a bunch of different apps that build wallets for it. Like those are new novel properties that are, uh, we're seeing users to choose because it's delivering values. And I think like th there's more better novel properties further down the decentralization spectrum. And that's where we're pushing with Ethereum and where we're pushing with base. But I, I, I don't think we should discredit entirely the work that Binance Smart Chain has done. Um, I think that that said, uh, the, the flip side of that is like users, I think they care about certain characteristics, um, uh, you know, like access, uh, like having the applications that they care about. Um, but uh, some of those drivers are like, is it cheap and is it easy to use? And I think this is something that Binance has done really well. They've made it cheap and they've made it easy to use. And I think today, um, Ethereum L2s, Ethereum L1s, they're not cheap and they're not easy to use. And so I think we're like, we, we kind of look at Binance to be like, wow, what if we made it as Binance Smart Chain? What if we made it as easy and cheap for people to use Binance Smart Chain, but instead of being in a more centralized context, it was it was fully decentralized and it was powered by Ethereum. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't that be powerful? Uh, wouldn't you know, it bring more applications and more use cases and give users an even better experience? But in order to unlock that, we need to provide that low cost experience that's easy to use. And th this is what Coinbase has been doing for the last decade. And I'm I'm just really excited for us to kind of enter the next era where we get to apply that same Coinbase ethos of being the most trusted, being the easiest to use to this new on-chain context where it feels so um, needed in order to reach the next billion people and bring them on-chain. That's awesome. Uh, so last question, five years or 10 years from now, uh, we see a world where people are using Ethereum and Base, but yep. like how, how would you define success for Base? And for base inside Coinbase, for example, and yeah. I love the name that, you know, it's part of Coinbase and, you know, um... yeah, it's, it's of Coinbase, but different. Um, yeah. we just got the base.eth. I really love base.eth. Uh, and you can think of like base.eth is an ENS name. And I think it, there's a kind of a beautiful, uh, like visual characteristic of it's like base.eth, like base is built on ETH. And then I think there's a even a more interesting of like coin.base.eth. We, we don't have any plans on that right now, but like coin is built on base, is built on ETH. There's this like kind of beautiful symmetry and uh, aesthetic nature of the name base and of the name Coinbase um, and how that can fit into Ethereum. So really, really grateful for that. Um, in terms of where we'll be in five to 10 years, um, I mean, like I'm not settling for anything less than the whole world on chain. <laughs> That's literally, I wake up every day and I'm like, what do I need to do today to bring billions of people on chain? A million developers, a billion users. That's my kind of like proximate goal. It's like a million developers come on chain and a billion users come on chain. And I, I don't like, personally, I don't think that's going to take 10 years. Um, I, I think it's going to happen faster than five years. Um, I think it's going to happen very quickly. Um, I think it, uh, we've, as an industry, been a little bit, uh, kind of like almost traumatized by the last decade of being like, when is crypto going to be useful? And like, <laughs> we've, like it's been 10 years of being like, oh, not quite yet, not quite yet, not quite yet, not quite yet. And I think all of us are like a little bit scared to be like, oh, like now. And I think that that means that like sometimes we underestimate how fast the change will happen when it is ready. And I think that that's what we're approaching right now like with low cost L2s, with better wallets, with better identity that's coming on chain. I think that we have been kind of going flatline and everyone's used to flatline. And then like with AI, which I think has happened in the last kind of year, it's gonna go up. And that up is not gonna be like, oh, now we're like curving up a little bit. It's gonna be <laughs> like, no, we're gonna hit, we're gonna hit the inflection point where these things work and then they're gonna really work. And I think that that's, that that's going to start that inflection is going to, I think maybe already started. We'll, we'll, we'll have 2020 hindsight in a few years, but I think it's has either already started or it's going to start sometime this year or early next year. And then we're going to be off to the races and we, crypto is going to basically globally expand um, to, to billions of people, millions of developers. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent with you there. I, I, I think there's a little bit of hype, but at the same time, there's a lot being built, you know, around AI. Uh, and crypto, like whenever you look at uh, tech, uh, in the short term, it looks linear, but, you know, in the long term, it looks exponential, like exponentials look linear in the short term, right? And, and 
if you look at the impact and you know like how much adoption how much exponential um things are happening inside right. you know crypto uh like it's, it's just crazy to see you know because it's a flywheel there are more developers there are more like more applications and things like that and now we're in the builder market phase maybe coming out of it but uh we have already 100 million people right that are into crypto and yeah. like most of them don't don't own most of their assets in crypto they own like maybe less than five percent right? right so like only looking at the people that already are into crypto it's their use their percentage of of you know maybe uh wealth is not like it's very small compared to what it will will grow and you know we still have the a billion people to reach uh, so it's going to be pretty interesting, a pre pretty interesting few years ahead. It's going to be exciting. Nowhere else be. I'd rather be than it's building gonna be the future and upgrading the system, bringing everyone on chain. All right. Thank you so much, Jesse. We're oh, gonna... <laughs> thank you. Happy yeah. Friday. And everyone Happy who's Friday. watching on Unlonely, thank you for being here. Uh, I uh, haven't been able to follow the chat the whole time, but it seems like we've got some good conversations there. Uh, thank you to the Unlonely team for hosting us on this platform. Uh, we wanted to do something on-chain native and this is, this felt right. Um, so excited to see what y'all build uh, and excited to come back sometime in the future.